So it's good to see everybody in, in, in this manner. So thanks for coming for my session. So for the next uh, one hour, I'm going to go through with you a very interesting topic, and that is deep learning. So over the past few few uh, few months or few few years, you have been hearing all these words, all these buzzwords, uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, deep learning. But what exactly are all these technologies in particular? I think for the past one or two years, you have been hearing about this topic called deep learning. So what is deep learning? How does it affect the way you write your applications? What are the possible applications of deep learning? So in this next 50 minutes or so, uh, I'm going to unravel the, the mysteries behind deep learning. And hopefully at the end of this session, it, you will have a better idea of how deep learning works. And hopefully you'll be able to, to be inspired to actually try out deep learning yourself. So, so let's get started. So by the way, my, my name is Wei Ming. So if you, are, uh, if you need to contact me at the end of this session, please feel free to send me an email. And then if you, if you want to know what are the things that I'm doing at this moment, feel free to go and visit my website. So let's talk about the agenda first. And, and let's see what we are the things that we'll be covering for the next uh, one hour. So first of all, we will talk about deep learning. What is deep learning as compared to the other broader terms like artificial intelligence, machine learning, so on and so forth? So in particular, you will learn how neural network works. So what is a neural network? What are the various layers inside a network? So we will talk about this concept known as weights and biases. How do you train them? And you will also learn about this concept known as activation and loss functions. What are the different types of activation and loss functions and, and which to choose? And last but not least, we'll talk about how to use the various optimizers available so that you can actually do what we call a back propagation to update the weights and, and, and biases so that it can improve the performance of your neural network. So these are the things that we will be talking about for the next 15 minutes or so. Now, once the theory is out of the way, we will have some live demos. So in particular, I'm super excited to show you how you can actually build your own neural network using TensorFlow and Keras. So for those of you who are new to this topic, TensorFlow and Keras, they are both frameworks from Google that allows you to build deep learning network, deep learning models very easily so that you can train them, you can use them for predictions. So in particular, I will show you how to use the MNIST dataset for deep learning, how to train using our own images. So I'm gonna show you a deep learning model that allows you to actually differentiate between a banana, an orange, a strawberry, so strawberry and, and some other fruits. So I will show you a demo of how to build that. And then we will make use of our webcam to actually do the recognition. So, so I have an orange here. So later on, let's see whether it can recognize our orange successfully. So we will also talk about how to ex actually export your TensorFlow model to uh, the TensorFlow Lite model so that you can actually use your um, model that you have already built to run on mobile devices. Now, in particular, I'm going to show you two demos in which you can actually uh, use the TensorFlow Lite model uh, to run on your mobile application. So if you have an Android device, get ready your Android device. I'm going to show you a link where you can actually download the APK, install that onto your phone, and then you can try along with my demos. Okay, so if you have an Android device, go ahead and, and grab one. If it's uh, not power up, make sure that you charge it up so that by the time I show you the link, you will be ready to actually download and install the app. Okay, so, for this particular talk, uh, I have about 60% theory and I have about 40% demos. So for the next 40 minutes or so, I'm going to talk a little bit about theory. So make sure that you stay focused. So there are a lot of topics that we're going to run through. Now, so before we go any further, so let me, or, or, or rather should I say, uh, Ask yourself this question, is this session for you? Now, 
if you are already an expert in deep learning, then probably this session is not for you because you already know all the, the, the fundamentals about deep learning. So go and grab your beer. And, and probably it's too early to have beer if, if you're in, in, in Europe and especially in, in Copenhagen. So if not, please enjoy. Now, before we actually go into the gory details of deep learning, so it is important for me to clarify this very important thing. Now, deep learning is a huge topic. It's a humongous topic. So it is not possible for me to explain everything in an hour. So it usually takes a semester long course to cover just the fundamentals. So if you have taken a course in, in AI or in deep learning in your university courses, so you typically would have spent about maybe a couple of months uh, just covering the, the fundamentals. And I am going to cover them in 30 minutes. So I'm going to run through a lot of theories with you, but I think the important thing to note is I'm going to focus on the how and not the why. Okay, so researchers, they have devoted their lifetime into researching all the mathematical uh, explanation for all the theories that we, we are going to present. So it's not fair for me to just uh, use 30 minutes to, to explain all these concepts. So we will focus on how deep learning works, and then I'll leave you to explore the details on your own. Okay, now let's uh, demystify three terms that we always encounter. So the first term is AI, artificial intelligence. <laughs> okay, so AI. So what is AI? So AI has, is a term that has been overused. So a lot of people are talking about AI today and a lot of schools are focusing on AI, teaching kids on how to learn uh, what is AI, what are the implications of the AI in, in their lives, so on and so forth. So basically, AI is basically a program that can sense, reason, and adapt. So it is the broadest, in, in the broadest sense of the word. So anything that can act like a human being, that can be classified as AI. Now, within AI itself, you have this branch of data science known as machine learning. So Machine learning has been the focus of a lot of uh, research for the past, maybe for, the, well, uh, I would say maybe 20, 30 years. So machine learning is basically statistical learning. So for those of you who have taken statistics in your high school, you know what is linear regression, logistic regression, so and so forth, or support vector machines. All these are machine learning. So machine learning is basically finding patterns in your data. So you have, so companies today collect a lot of data. And when you collect a lot of data, you want to be able to analyze them. You want to see certain patterns. Like for example, you collect data about your delivery trucks, your vehicles, and you want to be able to predict when this vehicle is going to break down. So machine learning allows you to do just that, make some predictions based on the data that you have collected. Now, within machine learning itself, you have this super exciting branch of machine learning known as deep learning. And that is the focus for this session. We're gonna talk about deep learning. So what is actually deep learning? So basically deep learning uses what we call neural networks. So basically you take one chunk of data and you throw it into deep learning algorithms. And the role of a deep learning algorithm is to help you establish what is the relationships between the input and the output. And magically, deep learning can actually help you to actually solve a lot of real life problems, such as facial recognition. Um, I'm going to show you that. Now, so there is a very interesting question that we always ask. Um, people always ask, uh, AI, are we there yet? So are we, are we already there? So the interesting thing is that if it works, it's not AI. So unfortunately, I think we are still working towards that, that goal of having a machine that can predict um, perfectly as the way a human being would predict, as you will see later on. So even though we try a lot of um, 
different techniques to actually train our model, sometimes our model will still make some wrong predictions. So I'm going to show you that uh, later on. Now, so let's go into the main topic of this session. What is deep learning? So generally speaking, deep learning is a machine learning method that takes an input X and predicts an output Y. Okay, so that's pretty straightforward. So, so let me show you this diagram. So deep learning basically takes in inputs, takes in the output, and the magic is in the middle layer. So in the middle layer, it basically tries to find the relationships between your input and your output. And that is deep learning. And deep learning uses neural network to accomplish its goal. So let's take a look at what is a neural network. Now, this term neural network sounds really sophisticated. It's Basically, they always say that this is basically the way the human brain works, right? But actually, it is not that complex. So let me show you a diagram. Now, don't be fooled by this diagram. This diagram, even though it looks complicated, is actually very simple to understand. Let me explain. So in a neural network, you have your inputs. So on the left-hand side, so if I can... Um, look at the, the, the screen. On the left hand side, you have your all your nodes. And all the on the left hand side is your input layer. So the input layer has got all the various nodes here. So this is known as the input layers, the input nodes. Now on the right hand side is your output node. So this is where you actually make your prediction. And in the middle, between the input layer and the output layer, this is your neural layers. And your neural layer, you can have one layer or you can have 10 layers or you have 20 layers, as many as you need to solve your problem. Okay, so how does all this work? Let me give you one very simple analogy. So this is one example of a input and the output. So suppose you want to train a deep learning model to differentiate between a cat and a dog. So in this case, your input would be a series of images of cats and dogs. So for the first image, for example, in this case, it's a dog. It's a dog. So imagine that this is an image of 28 by 28 pixels. So what we'd like to do is we might want to flatten this into a 784 pixel representation. And we take that 784 pixels, we fit it into the inputs. And because we know that this is a dock, so we indicate in our output that this is a dock. And what goes on here is that between the input layer and the output layer, you try to train the network so that you can actually know that based on this pattern of pixels, this is a dock. And then once you are done with that, you go on to train the next picture. So you put in another dog's picture, you train, okay, I get the numbers. And then I train using a cat. And at the end of the whole training, you have a set of magical numbers that would allow you to make some really, really cool predictions. Okay, sounds complex. I'm gonna show you by diving into the details, into the various layers. So let's define some terminologies. So I have my input layer, I have my output layer. So in between is what we call the hidden layers, the hidden layers, right? You can have as many as um, 10 or 20 or as few as one. So that's, that's all right. Now, the next important term that we need to understand is what we call weights and biases. So what are they? Now, let's go back to this diagram. Let's go back to this diagram. Now it's starting to get a little bit complicated, but rest assured, it's quite easy to understand. Now let's take a look at the screen here. Each input node is connected to the next node in the next layer. And in fact, they are all interconnected. We call this a, in, a fully connected network. So each connection, each connection, they have a weight. So in this case, I have a weight of a certain value. 
uh, so is the next node that connects to the next node in the input layer, in the next layer. So I have all the weights here. Now, in the hidden layers, each node also have a value. Each node has got a value. So let's define the terminologies now. So the numbers that accompany each connection is known as the weight. So each connection has got a weight and each node has got a bias. So you have a set of weights and biases. So in short, the goal of the neural network is to basically learn the set of magical weights and biases so that you can make very accurate prediction. So based on your inputs, like your cats and dogs uh, images, you are trying to learn this magical set of numbers. That's what you're trying to do. So now initially, all these numbers, all these weights and biases, they are randomized. They are randomized, meaning when I first start with this, before I started training, I'll randomly assign some numbers to this, all these weights and biases. And it is the role of the training process to adjust all these numbers such that at the end of the training, all these numbers would be the so-called perfect set of numbers for you to make accurate predictions. Okay, following me so far? Now let's move on. So to summarize, the goal of a neural network is to learn the weights of the network so that the predicted output is close to the target. And, and you will see later on, uh, when it comes to training, uh, depending on how much data you have to train, uh, it may take from as short as maybe two minutes to train up to a couple of weeks just to train a model to do some maybe facial recognition. All right, so that is the, the, the exciting thing about deep learning. Now, let's move on. Now, we have all the various nodes and we have all the various weights and biases. What do we do with all these numbers? Now, first of all, first of all, each input, the value of, of each input is multiplied by the weight. And you sum up all the products. So x1 multiplied by w1, x2 multiplied by w2, so and so forth. You sum them up, you plus this bias. So you multiply, you sum the bias. Okay? And here's one example. So for example, I'm using the example of the Titanic data set. So for those of you who have went through some Microsoft presentation, they always like to use the classic Titanic example. So in this case, um, the inputs may be the age of a passenger, the class of cabin that he stays in, and whether he has got the X number of siblings. So I take this number, the input, multiply by the weight. I take this input, multiply by the weight. I take this input, multiply by the weight. I plus the bias. So I, I get a final result of 4.74. So this is just one note. And then for the next node, you have to repeat the same process. So multiply, sum them up, and then plus the bias. Okay, so now, so this is what happens at each node. Once you are done with a layer, now before you take the value and propagate to the next layer, you do not take the final product and just propagate to the next layer you pass them through something called an activation function. Activation function. And so this is how it looks like. So after calculating the product and the sum of the bias, you fit them into something called a activation function. An activation function basically transforms the number that you have passed in into yet another number. And that is the magic, or, or rather the magical thing about deep learning. So let me show you one example. So in my previous example, after calculating the value for this node, I get 4.74 and I can pass it into a activation function. I can get another magical number. Now, don't worry about why did, how did the 4.74 becomes 0.84? I'm gonna explain that to you. 
Okay, but for this example, it's an arbitrary number. Now, so what's the use of an activation function? So an activation function basically allows you to control or normalize the output of a neural network. Okay, so uh, this concept of activation function is a little bit abstract at this moment, and it is always difficult to explain this in, in, in five minutes. But hopefully, uh, as we go along, you will have a clearer idea. Now, okay, having, having explained uh, what is an activation function, I think it is good for us to look at what are some of the common activation functions available. All right, so this, there are three main types of activation functions. One is called the binary step activation function. And the other one is known as the linear activation functions. Usually for deep learning network, we do not use linear activation functions because if you use linear activation functions, your deep learning model simply becomes a linear regression model, All right? So in this case, uh, we seldom use linear activation function. Now the third type of activation functions is known as a non-linear activation function. And that is what we commonly use when we build our deep learning model. Let's dive into the different types of activation function. Now, the first one is what we call a binary step function. So a binary step function is very straightforward. So remember, after calculating, calculating the value of a node, you pass it into an activation function so that it can transform to another number. So in this case, x is your input. That means the value that you have calculated for a node, you pass into an activation function. In this diagram, if the value that I have calculated is more than zero, it would return a one. So in this case, any input that is greater than zero, it will simply return you a one. And any input that is less than zero, it will simply return you a zero. Okay, so this is known as a binary step function. Now, so if you need help to visualize this binary step function, uh, let me give you one analogy. So it is basically like you place your hand on a kettle. So uh, you put some water into your kettle, you start boiling. So while the water is still relatively cool, not that hot, your hand will be there. But the moment your kettle hits a specific temperature, it becomes too hot for you to place your hand on the kettle, you will raise it up, okay? So either your hand is on the kettle or your hand is off the kettle. So that is the meaning of a binary step function. Now, like I mentioned, linear activation function is usually not used. So linear activation function basically means that whatever I, I, I get from your input, I will multiply by a, a constant to give you the output. So it is usually not used in deep learning uh, network, uh, deep learning neural networks. So I'm going to skip that for now. Now, what about non-linear activation functions? Now, there is one very commonly used linear activation function, and that is called the sigmoid activation function. So here is the chart showing the input and the output. So remember again, the x-axis represents what is being passed into the activation function and the output is on the y-axis. So if your input is a value that is positive, it will return you a value that is from 0 to 0 0.5 to 1. If your input is a negative value, it will return you a value from 0 to 0 0.5. Now, as you can probably observe, the output is from 0 to 1. So this is an ideal candidate to use when you are trying to perform a classification problem, when you're trying to find, okay, how, how many percent that this passenger from the Titanic ship would survive that disaster? Because the probability is always from 0 to 1. So, and, and, and usually we use this, we use this for predicting probabilities. Okay, so this is the sigmoid or also known as the logistic activation function. Now, so 
Usually, we use the sigmoid activation function at the output layer, where you are trying to predict a specific output. As I mentioned earlier, you are trying to predict, okay, how many, what is the percentage of survivor for a particular passenger on board the Titanic? So your answer that you want to get at the output is a value from zero to one. Okay, so that is the use of a sigmoid activation function. Now, besides the sigmoid uh, activation function, you have something called the softmax activation function. Now, the softmax activation function is very similar to the sigmoid activation function, except that it is usually used for probability distribution output. So, for example, you are trying to detect the existence of various objects in an image. So, I pass in an image and my neural network is trying to analyze, okay, how, what are the various uh, uh, objects in, in the image? So it can perform the, it can output the following. You say, okay, um, there is a probability of 0 0.7 that it is a dog, the image. And there is a probability of 0.2 that this is a cat. And there is a 0 0.1 probability that this is a guinea pig. So in this case, you are trying to distribute the probabilities. And the important thing about softmax is the three probabilities that you generate, they would all sum up to one. So here is another uh, uh, example. So when your output needs to be um, a, 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 a distribution of probabilities, you use the softmax activation function. Okay, so I hope you are following with me at this moment. Okay, now, so there are some more non-linear activation functions. Um, for example, you have the hyperbolic tangent activation function. Now, if you recall, the sigmoid activation function returns an output from zero to one. So sometimes that is not sufficient. So sometimes you want to be able to to, to get an output from minus one to one. So in this case, you use this hyperbolic tangent activation function, and we usually use them for two class classifications. Okay. And both hyperbolic tangent and logistic uh, log sigmoid activation function, they are usually used in feed forward networks. So just bear in mind. Now, besides the um, various specific uh, activation functions that we have seen. There is one that is very commonly in use today, and that is known as the ReLU activation function. Something interesting. So this is known as the rectified linear unit. So we usually use them in a special type of neural network known as a convolutional neural network. Now, because we, we only have one hour to talk about deep learning, uh, we don't have time to talk about convolutional neural network, but, but let me just tell you that this is one of the most important network that you need to know when you are building deep neural networks for image classification. So later on, we have some examples of that, but just to let you know, convolutional neural network is a sp special type of neural network that specializes in image classification. So, What's so special about ReLU? So if you look at the chart here, so on the left is my sigmoid activation function. So I have my, my output from zero to one. Now the ReLU looks a little bit similar, except that for inputs that are more than zero, it is a linear distribution. So it, it returns you a, a, a linear output. Now, for all the output that is less than zero, it straight away returns you zero. So that's how a ReLU activation function looks like. Now, of course, the, the mathematics behind this, uh, I'll leave it to you to go and explore why this is a much better activation function compared to the others. Now, there is one problem with the ReLU, and that is, when the input is less than zero, you see that your output is all mapped to zero. Sometimes that is not really desirable. Sometimes you want to be able to 
um, get a slightly negative value. So in order to fix this ReLU activation function, we have something called the leaky ReLU. And so how does it look like? If you look at the left, this is your ReLU. On the right, uh, on the left is your ReLU. And on the right is your leaky ReLU. So it leaks a little bit on the left. Okay, so this is interesting, but again, uh, if you want, you can go ahead and explore the, 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 the mathematics behind all this. Okay, so in summary, in summary, we use activation function at the end of every node, uh, every level, every layer. So every at the end of every layer, we will apply activation function so that we will take the output, we pass the next layer, next layer, apply activation function, and then finally, we go to the output layer. And at the output layer, uh, you use either a sigmoid activation function or you use a softmax activation to, to distribute the probabilities. So here are some examples. So I can have a output layer, female uh, or male. So I can use a softmax to distribute the probabilities so that I can make some predictions as to how many percent that this is female, how many percent this is male. Or if my output is just a single node, I can use a sigmoid activation function to convert the value so that I can get a value from zero to one. Okay, so I hope that that is clear. Okay, let's move on. So it looks like I am running out of time. So I'm going to speed things up a little bit so that I have time for demos. Loss function. So at the end of the one cycle where at the end, where you calculated all the values, you fit into activation function, you get the value, you fit into the next layer. At the end, you want to have a way to measure your performance. How far are you away from the actual result? You need to evaluate that so that you know whether your neural network is calculating correctly. If not, how do you actually go back and update the weights and biases? So we use something called a loss function. So if you are solving a linear regression problem or rather you're solving a regression problem, for example, you're training a network to predict certain values. That is known as a regression problem. You can use the mean squared error loss function and it's pretty straightforward. You get the expected output, you minus the predicted value, you square them, you take the average. And that would give you an idea of how far are you away from the truth? Of course, if you look at this model, look at this formula, if you get a value of zero, what does it mean? It means that your prediction is spot on. So you have perfect prediction. There is no need to continue anymore. You have the perfect model. Okay. So the goal is to minimize the loss function. Now, so the loss is basically a summation of all the errors made for each example in training. So it shows you how well the model is doing for these two sets. And unlike accuracy, loss is not a percentage, it's a value. So you want to achieve a loss value as close to zero as possible. And the lower the loss, the better your model. So there are quite a different number of um, uh, loss functions that you can use today. And if you are trying to, 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 to solve a binary classification problem, you can use something called a binary cross entropy. If you are so solving a, a multi-class classification problem, you use what we call a categorical cross entropy loss function. And for regression problem, you can use a mean squared error function. So, what, what, so what, what, what's the idea behind entropy? What's the meaning of entropy? So here's one example. So an entropy, it's basically a log lost. So what does it mean? So if your true label is one, so for example, you are trying to predict the value of something and the true value of the, pre the, true value of the output is one, but you predicted that this output is 0.1, so what does it mean? It means that your loss is very, very high. If you look at my, my, my cursor, if, if the true value is one and you predicted this to be 0 0.1, and so when you move up, you're gonna be penalized with a relatively big loss. 
Whereas if the true label is one and you predicted that this is 0 0.9, so if you look at 0 0.9, so your loss is very, very little. And the smaller your prediction, the higher your loss. So cross entropy is basically a way to actually penalize your, 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 your loss. Okay, so the higher the loss, the, 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 or the smaller the loss, the better performing your model is. So I hope that is clear. Okay, now, so let's uh, summarize. Eh? So activation function, you use it at every layer. And then at the final layer, you use a loss function so that you can know, okay, uh, at this layer, at this layer, um, I, I want to know how well my model is performing. If it is not performing, then I can actually go back and update the weights. Now, which brings us to the next important topic, optimizer. Optimizer. I actually have some detailed slides to show you how to do back propagation, but I think because of time constraint, um, I'm, I'm going to give everybody the, the slides and then you guys can actually go and explore the slides on your own. Um, I, I want to save some time so that I can show you some demos. Okay. So, but but basically, what is the optimizer? So now that you have calculated the loss, what do you do with that? You know that your model is performing this well or this badly. How, what, what do you do with that? You want to use an optimizer to go back and adjust the weights and biases. So Optimization algorithms are used to update weights and biases and, and to reduce the error. So there are three commonly used optimizers. Um, one is the SGD, Stochastic Gradient Descent. Next one is Adagrad. Um, third one is Adam. Okay, so you update the weights through a technique known as back propagation. So the back propagation, how does it work? So look at this diagram here. So at the end of the at the end of the the first round, so after calculating all the values, you predicted that the value is zero point one three, but the actual is one. So you are quite well um, far off from the the expected output. So in this case, you need to go, be able to go back to the weights and the biases. You need to adjust them so that you can actually reduce your loss. Okay, make sense. So this technique is known as back propagation. And, and using back propagation, the network can actually backtrack through all its layers to update the weights and biases of every node in the opposite direction of the loss function. Now, I, I have a series of uh, 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 slides to explain to you how back propagation works. So basically, you can express them as a loss function. Um, and then you can actually plot a, a curve to show how a loss function looks like. Um, let, let me see whether I have time to, to run through all this because, um, okay, I think I, I, I can try that. Okay, so let's look at this chart. So on the x-axis is your weight and on your y-axis is your loss. So if you go back to this slide, your input vectors, your input multiplied by the set of weights would give you the predicted output. And you have your expected output here. And the difference between this predicted output and the target output is known as the loss value. And I would be able to express this loss value as a function of the weight. And I can plot a chart that looks like this. Okay. And if you look at the, the, the chart here, we aim to go at the minimum. So we want to minimize our loss so that our deep learning model would be as accurate as possible. So uh, let me show you one example. So let me just show you one example. So I have the following inputs, x1, x2, and I have the expected output. In this case, we are doing a regression problem. So what we are trying to do here is that we are trying to build a deep learning model so that we can take this input four, five, and we try to find the relationship between four and five and the output six. And so this is my graph. My graph looks like this. I have my input. I multiply by my weights. 
So I can calculate my output here. Now for simplicity, I'm leaving out the bias. So I'm leaving out the bias. So I, I, I but, but if you were to add in the bias, the, the, it doesn't really affect the, the calculation. So, and the output is here, and this is your loss value. So the loss value is equal to y hat minus y square. Now, so I can initialize my initial weights. Remember the initial weights are all randomized. So I put in some values, I multiply them, I get my loss value. And what do I do next? So I set a formula. So I have y hat, I have y hat equal to x1 weight one plus x2 weight two. And I can express my loss as y hat minus y square. So I get this formula. Now I can take a partial differential. So I can calculate a dl dy hat, dy hat d width one, dy hat d width two. So I can get all these values. I can get all these values. Now, what is the significance of the, all these values? I can plug it back into the graph. So my dy hat d width one is here. So what does it represent? It represents the rate of change of y hat with respect to weight one. So it basically means the amount of weight one that you change will affect the predicted y. Same goes for this part here where you have the dy hat d weight two. So it basically signifies the rate of change of y hat with respect to the weight two. And finally, you have this dl dy hat. So that is the rate of change of the loss value with respect to y hat. And using the SGD method, the stochastic gradient descent method, you could actually update your weight w1, w2 with the following formula. So you have the new weight one equal to weight one minus the learning rate multiplied by the rate of change of the loss value with respect to weight one. So, so to reduce the loss, you just need to move your weight one in the opposite direction from the derivative. Hence, you have a minus. Okay, so I'm going to leave the, the slides for everybody so that you guys can actually take a look at that uh, later on and trace through. It's a lot of math, I, I understand. So um, let's take a look at, so to calculate weight one, you have to plug in all the values, all the formulas that you have. And then at the end of the calculation, you get the new value for weight one. And you perform the same thing for the weight two. And at the end of the whole uh, calculation, you get a new value for weight two. And then, so now you're ready to plug it back in to this uh, graph. And you repeat the same process for the next row. Okay. Okay. So I know it's a lot of things to digest in this short amount of time. And I think I'm going to jump straight into the demos because there are a lot of things that I want to show you. So I'm going to skip, skip this for now. Okay, so in summary, you use activation at the end of every layer. And then at the end, you use your loss function and your optimizer to actually backtrack to update the weights and biases. Okay, demo. And I think this is what everybody is waiting for. Now, to build deep learning models, you can you have a, a number of choices. You can use the TensorFlow and Keras framework from Google, or you can use the PyTorch from Facebook. So, but for this example, I'm going to use TensorFlow and Keras. So, TensorFlow is an open source library for numerical computation and deep learning. And the problem with TensorFlow is that it goes down to a very low level involving fact vectors, tensors, so on and so forth. So it's not easy for beginners to, 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 to use. So 
a engineer, an engineer from Google, actually wrote a wrapper called Keras to wrap around TensorFlow so that you don't have to deal with the low level details. And that is the use of Keras. Now, so the first demo that I want to show you is this. So what I have here is that I have a Python program that inputs the um, a classic data set used for deep learning. Um, learning, um, And it's called MNIST data set. So let me just show you how it works first. So I'm going to run this. So it's going to go through the entire program. And so it's importing the libraries. So, so at this point, it is clear that this is a set of images. The MNIST data set is a set of images representing all these handwritings. Okay, all these handwritings. And okay, so let's continue. So I am importing all the images and then I'm doing the training. So, so the training actually went on. I have created a model with the following layers. And then um, because the training went on quite fast, so as you can see that I have a number of epochs. The number of epochs means for the entire training set, how many times do you want to subject this whole training set for training? So I'm going to train this for 50 times. So I'm going to take my whole set of images, repeat this 50 times. So as you can see, you, can, you, you have a lot of updating of the weights. So as I train, I get the accuracy. I get the accuracy. So initially it's 0 0.62 and then right till the end, I get a 92% accuracy. And once I've done that, I can evaluate my, my, my model with my test set and I can plot a chart to show the accuracy. And I can load a sample image and see how, it, how well it predicts. So, so far so good. So it is able to predict this very nicely. Now, towards the end, after running through the whole model, I want to save it as a, a, a H5 file. So I, I want to save the train model so that I can actually use it somewhere else. I could also export this as a TensorFlow light model. And I'm going to show you a example that I have written. There you go. So I have taken this model that I have trained and I have exported it to TensorFlow light and using Flutter. I've created this application that allows me to basically scribble on my phone. So I can try something like this. Do recognize. It recognizes too. Not too bad. Okay, and then nine. And then I can scribble zero. There you go. So not too bad. So that is the first demo that I want to show you. Now, the second demo is interesting. Second demo is interesting. Let me show you what I have up here. Now I have a set of images uh, that I want to train. So I am creating a deep learning model. Uh, specifically, I'm creating a CNN, a convolutional neural network to help me recognize images. So what are the images I'm trying to train? I'm trying to train my model to recognize images like bananas, durians, okay, uh, oranges, as well as strawberries. So I'm going to run it. So I'm going to run this. So it will go ahead and look at my images. And OK, so it's just training now. So it is basically looking at all my images and trying to analyze, trying to build a deep learning model to, to recognize images. So, okay, let's wait a couple of seconds. I think this is going to be pretty fast. So I only set uh, the training to, to run for 15 epochs. As you can see, if you have images, it's going to take a longer time to, to train. So it also depends on your the resolution of your images as well as the number of images you have for each category.
Okay. So I, I, I have a question. I, I think somebody is asking what number is the, is the picture transformed to? So it depends on what kind of uh, network you're building. So basically, you when you, when you have images, you, you basically takes the individual pixel of the image. And a lot of times, we, we basically transform that into a value from 0 to 1. So we basically normalize that. But in, in a CNN, you can actually load a colored picture. And then you have a three channel RGB channels. And then you run through a series of what we call filters. Okay, So, so basically, in short, we, we deal with the pixels of the image. So I, I hope I, I've answered that question. I, I think there's one question on Slido. Okay, so once we are done with that, okay, so let's see how well our um, deep learning model performs. So you look at this. So these are all my test pictures. These are the pictures that I have not used for training. The, so the, my deep learning model has never seen all these pictures. So I, I will run this. And so it predicts that this is a banana. Okay, so so far so good. This is a durian. Okay, this is a strawberry. So far so good. Banana. This is a durian. Hmm. So far so good. This is a banana. Banana. This is a durian. As you can see, I'm a big big fan of durians. This is a durian. This is a durian. This is a strawberry. So far so good. This is a strawberry. Ah, what about if you have a mixture of strawberries and bananas. So in this case, it returns you some probability and it says that, hey, maybe the number of uh, strawberries in, in this picture is too overwhelming. So it predicted that this is a strawberry. So you, you can compare the, the probabilities. And, and the next one, durian, okay, then that's, that's fine, that's fine, banana, uh, durian, and then durian, and then this is an orange, Orange, hey, not too bad, not too bad. So, so you can see that the the accuracy of this is not not that bad, not that bad. Now, I have trained this model. It would be more fun to actually use a live picture. So I'm going to do that. So, just give me one second. I'm going to switch off the the, the video so that you won't see me, but you will see my screen, right? So, I'm going to do that. Hey, so just one second, I am loading the application. Okay, there you go. Oops, it says that I'm a banana. Okay, so I am going to show you some pictures. So, Unfortunately, I don't have a durian to, 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 to show you right now. So I am going to show you some pictures that I have on my phone. Okay, so I'm going to put this. And hey, strawberry. So that's, that's pretty good. Um, banana. Okay, I'm going to lower the, I think it's too bright. Okay, banana. And then uh, durian, OK. Um, let me see, do I have a, OK, so let, let's try the strawberry one more time. OK, not too bad, not too bad. OK, so, so let's, let me just go back. Okay, so that is the second demo that I want to show you. So you are able to train a CNN to recognize uh, images. You can, you can also train CNN to recognize phases as well, although that requires a little bit more effort, but you can do that using CNN. Now, the third one that I want to show you is using some pre-trained models, some pre-trained models. So ImageNet is basically a, a, a repository of all the images that they have collected. And they run all these competitions every year. And they invite researchers to actually uh, uh, submit models that allows, uh, that, 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 uh, that solve all these image recognition problems. So here are some of the common ImageNet uh, pre-trained models that you can actually use. 
to recognize different types of objects. So in this case, I can use a VG16, Inception V3, ResNet, Mobile Net. So I'm going to run through. So when I run this, it will basically download the train model from the, the website, the, the Keras website, or TensorFlow website. And so I, I think it's, it's still loading. But what I want to show you here is that it is able to actually help you predict, um, given an image, what is the object in, in, in that image. So it's pretty accurate. So is it, is it moving? OK, so it's moving. It's moving. OK, there you go. So VGG16 basically tells me that this is a banana. And it also tells you that this might be a hook or a slug or a hub or a flatworm. So this is the result from all the other pre-trained networks that you can actually use. Okay. Now, I think my time is running up. So I just have one final demo that I want to show everybody. So you can also use this in your mobile application. So I can select a photograph and I can select, let's say, a picture. And it will tell me that, hey, um, this is a car. And then if I select another photo, I can select a, a birthday cake. It tells me that, hey, this, this is a cake. And then I can select something else like, let me see, uh, a fruit. And interestingly, it recognizes that this pineapple is, is a banana. OK, so remember, for AI, if it works, it's not AI. OK, so I think this is what I have uh, uh, the time available for me. OK, so, so you can ask the questions on Slido. So let me, OK, so these are the questions that I have received. Now, somebody is asking, will it perform as good with different backgrounds than white? A yellow background for a banana. So, uh, no, in, in fact, if you have a white background and with the image in front, that would actually perform better. So, so, um, so the, the, the key thing is that you, you should keep your background as clean as possible. You, it doesn't have to be white, but as long as it doesn't uh, interfere with the object in the foreground, um, that would be good enough. Any more questions? So I'm going to make all these slides available. So I'll be posting the link uh, to Slack. So if you want the slides, you can actually go to the um, Slack uh, discussion group. And then um, you, you should be able to find that. If you, you don't see that, just send me an email. And then I'll be more than happy to, to email you that, that slide deck. Any more questions? OK, if no questions. Thank you very much. I hope to see you again, uh, hopefully in person or at the next uh, NDC event. Thank you very much.